Well, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, please open up with me to the book of Galatians. And then we will begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time, Father, to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, to hear your word. Father, we pray that you would give us submissive hearts to your word, Father, that you would speak through your spirit to our hearts, Father, to edify us, to build us up, to convict us, to exhort us, and to rebuke us where necessary, Father, that we might become more and, my, more, and more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as Brother Bill um, stated, Father, we lift up Sue this morning with her doctor's appointment. Father, we also lift up Josh and Reagan. Father, with these concerns, we pray that in each case you would oversee each situation with your providence, with your grace, and your mercy, and grant any healing uh, where necessary. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, the title of this message this morning is Paul's God-Given Apostleship. And just to tie the message this morning, the first of the messages in with what we heard last night from Brother Gary George, if you have your text, I will begin reading in verse 15 of Galatians 1. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? The word of the Lord. And so the first major section of this, this portion of the book of Galatians is Paul's calling and apostleship is from God. It's not from man. And we already heard 
briefly with this last night, where Paul was not taught the gospel by any man. He received it by revelation from the Lord himself. And so this reference in verse 16, of course, was pleased to reveal his son to me, of course, is a reference to Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And of course, when Paul has letters from the high priest to go into the church in, in Syria, in Damascus, in Antioch, to bring them back to Jerusalem, to bring them under trial before the Sanhedrin. Of course, a bright light shines around him. He's knocked from his horse, and he hears a voice speaking to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And of course, Paul asks, who are you, Lord? And I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The voice responds, and of course, Paul is thinking, I am a dead man. I am a dead man. And then, of course, he's commanded to go into the city, then a brother Ananias is brought to him. And I want to highlight two specific sections which further this point that Paul's apostleship and his calling is not from man, it is from God, from whom he received it. And when Ananias receives a vision from the Lord to go to Paul to lay his hands upon him so that he might receive his sight in Acts chapter 9, Ananias is like, I've heard of this man, Lord. He's, he's bringing persecution against your your servants, my, my brothers and sisters. And then the Lord responds to him in verses 15 and 16. He says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. He is my chosen instrument. Okay, underscoring that this apostleship, this calling, is from God, it's not from man. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And later on in Acts chapter 22, we have a very similar testimony where Paul is making his defense before the Jews in the temple. And in verse 21, he recounts a vision from the Lord where the Lord tells him, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Okay? And of course, in, in Greek, the verb to send is apostello, of course, where we get the word apostolos, apostle. And so these two passages are witnessing amongst a, a plethora of others that Paul's apostleship, his calling is from God. It's not from man. He didn't receive it from the other apostles. And we're going to see Paul keeps his distance, his distance relative for a very long time apart from the other apostles, underscoring this fact that they're on the same apostolic team, under the same sovereign God with the same gospel mission, but he did not receive it from them. And then so in verse 17, he says, or actually the end of verse 16, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So after his conversion, he begins to preach the gospel in Damascus. He doesn't immediately go to Jerusalem, to consult Peter and James and John and the other apostles, but he immediately begins to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And concerning this particular passage, Calvin writes, relying on the authority of God alone and asking nothing more, he proceeded to discharge the duty of preaching the gospel. Because this gospel, had, he had received it from God by a revelation, he wasn't going with the apostles to check and make sure that he had received the same thing. He didn't receive the calling from them. It was from the same God who called them. And this is not intended, Paul is not intending an insult to the other apostles, as they themselves are under the authority of God themselves and have received the same similar calling in their own regard. And I want to, in this particular passage, highlights a lot of historical data where Paul is actually defending his apostleship. And then so, Paul speaks about in verse 17, where he went away into Arabia. Now, some hold this to be regions of the Arabian desert that would have been in eastern Syria, which is a possibility. Others, because of what's later in the book in Galatians 4.25, with the reference to Mount Sinai in Arabia, some hold that Paul actually went to Mount Sinai. That's a possibility. And then there's about a three-year time period, which we're not given a lot of data. And so... Some have perhaps seen that Paul was trained by the Lord for about three years, and some see a pattern there with about the same amount of time that the other apostles were trained by the Lord in his earthly ministry.
Again, we're not given a lot of data, and as Calvin himself states, it is best to refrain from going where the scriptures do not go. Then in about, in verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days, but I saw none of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Now, of course, because of this gap of three years, Paul's not going up to check and make sure that he was preaching the correct gospel. Paul knows that he's preaching the true gospel because he received it from the Lord. The purpose of this visit was rather to demonstrate that he, like they, had been called by God, that they had the same gospel interests. Okay, they're gonna have, we're going to see they have different spheres. The other apostles were called to minister to the circumcised. Paul is called primarily to preach to the Gentiles. And that he was in no way at variance with them. He doesn't have competing interests. He doesn't have opposing interests. He's not competing against them. He's not opposing them. So in other words, they have the same sovereign God, they have the same divine calling, they have the same gospel mission, and they're on the same apostolic team, working together. And this visit was not to gain the approval or to gain a certification of what he was preaching and teaching. It's more to demonstrate that they had both been called by God, they had the same interests. Okay? And he also mentions here James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Okay? And I would be remiss if I didn't say contra Roman Catholicism. Okay, this, of course, preaches against and teaches against this perpetual virginity of, of Mary, the mother of Christ. And I want to point out here, it says that he only remained with Cephas 15 days. So this is a very relative short stay. And one would expect that if his calling had been from man, he would have already visited them prior to this, and he would have been staying with them longer than this. But you have a three-year period where he's preaching the gospel after his conversion. He visits Jerusalem for about 15 days, a very short span. And then he returns to Syria and Cilicia, as it says in verse 21. Okay? And of course he returns to preaching the word, and he's preaching it in power and in the Holy Spirit. And in verse 22, And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So Paul is continuing his preaching message of the gospel in Syria and Cilicia. And the churches in Judea are hearing reports about Paul's preaching and they're glorifying God. And of course, why? Why are they doing this? Because only God could have brought about this conversion. You have this man who is striving beyond his contemporaries in, in the religion of Judaism to the extent that he was persecuting the church, that he was pursuing them, not just in, his, in, in the environs of Jerusalem. He's actually going to other areas of the Roman Empire and pursuing Christians elsewhere, okay, demonstrating his zeal. Only God could have brought about this change in Paul. Unless we think that this is an isolated case, just as, as Brother Gary George mentioned last night, this is what happens to all of us. God is pursuing us. God is the only one who can bring about the change in the human heart. And we serve a God that brings, is the only one who can bring forth good out of evil. Okay? The evil of the human heart, God gives us a divine heart surgery and changes us and makes us alive. And I, and I would specifically want to note something that Calvin brings up in his, con, uh, his commentary on Galatians. He says, If the churches of Judea, who had only heard respecting Paul, were led to give glory to God for the astonishing change which he had wrought in Paul, how disgraceful was it that those who had beheld the fruits of his amazing labors in Galatia should not have acted a similar part? So if the mere report was enough for the former to glorify God, why did not the facts before their eyes satisfy the latter? Because the people in Galatians had seen all of the signs, they had heard the preaching of God in power, and yet that they were so easily turning away. 
when all of these churches in Judea who, who had only heard the word of God, who had heard these reports about Paul preaching the word of God, they were glorifying God because of the change that God had brought about in Paul. And yet the Galatians who had seen Paul in person and heard the teaching for an extended period of time, for however long Paul was staying with them, they had seen all of these things, they had so quickly turned away. And also the fact that Paul was personally unknown to the Judean churches indicates Paul had very little contact with them, and he wasn't dependent upon them. Okay, and again you see this kind of separation from kind of, shall we say, the mother churches in Jerusalem and Judea, where Paul is preaching the word in power in Syria and Damascus and Cilicia. Okay, and so this demonstrates that Paul's calling and apostleship, it's not from the apostles who are in Jerusalem, it is from God. It is from God. And then again, when we switch over into verse 2, notice the time gap here. Then after 14 years, notice this huge separation. You have the three years after his conversion, you have a brief visit in Jerusalem for 15 days, and then you have this huge span of 14 years okay, before he goes up to Jerusalem again. Okay? One would expect the actual opposite if Paul was, in fact, as dependent as these influential Judaizers were so claiming, that he had received, that he was a false apostle, that he was an imposter, that he had received it from man and not God. But that's simply not the case. And so Paul goes to Jerusalem after 14 years, and again, again, evincing, as I just said, Paul's calling and apostleship is from God, it's not from men. Okay? And then continuing in verse 2, I went up because of a revelation and set before them. And so he's taking Barnabas and Titus along with me, or along with him, and he goes up because of a, a revelation that he has received, and he sets before the apostles though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So a couple of things to note here. Of course, we have false brothers. They're trying to enslave believers, and we already heard some of this yesterday. And notice they're secretly brought in. They're false, they're false brothers. So we have Paul ascribing rightly under spirit inspiration, the evil motives that these individuals have in coming into these Galatian churches and trying to enslave believers. And how are they trying to enslave them? They're trying to bring them back under the Mosaic law, that they will be justified by the keeping of the law, okay, which we know from the Jerusalem council when Peter rises up, why are you trying to bring the Gentiles back under the law which our fathers themselves could not keep and we cannot keep? And we see from verse 3, where, Tide, where it says, Titus was not forced to be circumcised. And of course, the implication here is, is that these Judaizers were insisting that Titus be circumcised in order to be justified. And of course, Paul steadfastly resists and defends the gospel because he states that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. That this is the spirit, this is the motivation why Paul is doing this and resisting Titus, who is a Gentile, being circumcised. Because he does not want this to be presented that you must be circumcised in order to follow Christ, in order to be a believer, in order to be justified. He wants to make a very clear distinction. And so Paul steadfastly resists this distortion of gospel. Of course, we are not saved by works. And so this is, this is a salvation by works that's slowly trying to creep itself back in, which other speakers will speak on later with these elementary principles of the world, which the keeping of the law is equated to. And in verse 2, verse 2 uses a particular phrase which comes back 
every so often in, throughout the book, those who seem to be influential, and it seems to be a, f- a phrase that Paul is using based off of something that these Judaizers were using. Okay, those who seem to be influential, or those who consider themselves to be influential, or their reference to the true apostles in their view down in Jerusalem. And so Paul is using this phrase to make a very clear distinction at certain points. And also note how coming back under the law of Moses is equated with slavery. It's equated with slavery. Okay? And it's actually going to be referred to as the pedagogue later on. And, and I, won't, I won't elaborate very much on that, but of course, if you know anything from Roman society, so I teach at a classical Christian school, and so we, we have to prepare our students for the national Latin exam, and so we talk about how Roman society was structured, and so a household slave was given to ensure that uh, or the child of a Roman citizen or a child of individual made it to their studies, and that's the function of the law. It's bringing These Judaizers are attempting to bring people back under the slavery of the law. Why? Because the law is a ministry of death written on tablets of stone. It does not give one the ability to keep it. And it only brings about death. Only the Spirit gives life. And so you're going to see this contrast later on in the book of Galatians, which, which is elaborated even more fully between the law and the Spirit. And so the application here for us is we need to zealously guard against any corruption or distortion of the gospel. Whether it comes in the form of licentiousness or lawlessness, or whether it comes in the form of legalism, attempting to earn God's favor by our own merits or our own actions. Of course, salvation is not by works. Salvation is only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We need to zealously guard our freedom in Christ because Christ has set us free to be this kingdom of priests to truly worship God in the freedom of holiness and the freedom of righteousness. And I want to briefly say a word here regarding the circumcision of Titus versus the circumcision of Timothy that's mentioned elsewhere in the Pauline epistles and in the book of Acts. And so if you briefly, if you'll turn with me briefly to 1 Corinthians 9, I just want to read a passage before I briefly speak of this. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 21. And so some might say, since Paul refused to circumcise Titus, and yet he circumcises Timothy at a later point, that Paul's inconsistent. And of course, that is not true. So let us read, starting in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Okay, so why did Paul refuse to circumcise Titus? Because these Judaizers were insisting that in order to be justified before God, one had to keep the law of Moses. And of course, that is antithetical to the gospel. So why did he circumcise Timothy? Because He circumcised Timothy because he was taking Timothy. Remember Paul's practice when he went, entered into a new city? He would enter the synagogues and teach and debate with the Jews, and some would be converted, some would resist, and then he would turn to the Gentiles. And he was taking Timothy with him, and so he circumcised Timothy so that he might win Jews. So it's not, so the fact that Timothy is uncircumcised would not be a hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. And so notice the difference of motivation. He refuses to circumcise Titus because he doesn't want to confuse what justification and what the gospel is, whereas he wants to aid the proclamation of the gospel to save as many people, both Jew or Gentile, as possible. 
and remove any hindrance to it that he can. So there's a complete difference in motivation here. Then the next, the apostles recognize that Paul's calling and apostleship is from God. They themselves, so the apostles who are in Jerusalem, the other apostles, they recognize that his calling and apostleship is from God. So in verse 6 of Galatians 2, and from those who seem to be influential, there's that phraseology again, that the Judaizers were likely referring to the other apostles as the ones who were influential, versus Paul, who they viewed to be not influential. And, so for, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. And so Paul comes out and specifically states that his interactions with the apostles, that 15-day stay with the apostle Peter, and later on after 14 years when he returns, they added nothing to his ministry. Okay? He didn't have to clarify any doctrinal issues. He didn't have to receive accreditation from them. He didn't have to receive their permission. They added nothing to Paul's ministry or calling. And if Paul's calling is from God and his apostleship is from God, that makes sense. However, if his apostleship and calling is from man, we would expect the other. And that's not the case. And then the second point in this particular section of the book of Galatians, the other apostles recognize that Paul's ministry and calling are from God. Verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, to Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, to Jews, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And so the other apostles, they clearly saw that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles by God, just as they themselves had been entrusted with the gospel to the Jews. So like I said before, it's the same sovereign God, it's the same divine calling, it's the same gospel mission. There might be a focus where the other apostles are primarily to the Jews and Paul is to the Gentiles, and it's the same apostolic team. There's no variance. There should be no competition. They're not, they don't have competing interests. And why did they see this? Why did the other apostles see this? Because they recognized that the same God who worked through Peter and the other apostles for the ministry to the Jews was also working through Paul for the ministry to the Gentiles. You have numerous instances, the Council of Jerusalem being one of them, where Paul comes down and he recounts all of the miracles and all of the conversions and all of the news from his ministry in Cilicia, in Syria, and in Antioch, and he recounts it to them, and the apostles recognize that the same God who was at work with in them is at work in Paul. And what does this recognition result in? It results in apostolic fellowship, an apostolic partnership. And so if Paul is this false apostle like the Judaizers are claiming, he's an imposter, why are the other apostles recognizing that God is at work in him, and why are they receiving him with fellowship, and why are they partnering with him, and why are they not rebuking him? If he's a false apostle, if he's teaching something that's odd, why are they doing that? So in verse 9, and when James and Cephas and John, who seem to be pillars, we have that same language again, who seem to be, perceived the grace that was given to me. So note, the apostles are recognizing and perceiving the same God who is at work in them. They can perceive the grace that is at work in Paul and Barnabas. They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so again, if Paul's gospel message is at variance with the other apostles, one would expect more than just the request of partnering with them to minister to the poor. And in fact, you don't see that. You don't see that. Because it's the same gospel message of salvation through faith in Christ.
And so notice James, Peter, and John, the so-called pillars of the Jerusalem church, they give the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul. And because of this knowledge, because of this fellowship, they agree to partner with them. They're not at variance. They're not competing. This is the same apostolic team under the same God with the same divine calling. And Paul and Barnabas, they agree that they should minister to the Gentiles and the others should minister to the Jews. Okay? They're partnering with just slightly different spheres of influence. And also the only request, the only request that they made of Paul and Barnabas is that they remember the poor. And of course, Paul affirms that this was the very thing that I was set to do. And this comes up in the, in the Acts of the Apostles where, and in the Epistles where he's frequently taking collections when he aids with the famine that strikes Judea in the reign of Claudius. Okay. And so there's no change of doctrine. The apostles don't confront him and be like, oh, you're teaching wrong, you're teaching incorrectly here. This is falsehood. You need to correct this, Paul. They don't, they don't say that at all. They don't say that at all. They partner with him and they affirm that he is teaching the true message. Okay. And even here, even here there's application for us. Okay, so we need to strive to guard against pride and rivalry with our fellow believers, partnering with them in the same way that Paul and Barnabas partnered with the other apostles, partnering in the same gospel mission to preach the gospel to the nations, to receive one another with fellowship, and we need to guard against foolish controversies as well. One of the, one of the things that I probably say ad nauseum to my high school students in the Bible classes that I have with them is this phrase, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, in the essentials unity, in the non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. Okay, and so we need to keep the main thing the main thing. So Christ, the gospel, those doctrines, justification, and in those things like eschatology and, and other things, those are important, not to undermine those, but they should never be a litmus test to fellowship or a source of rivalry or a source of controversy. And then, of course, all of these things are to be done in love. And, of course, also we need to remember the poor who are with us and around us and to minister to them, because this is frequently cited in the Scriptures as being close and near to the heart of God, caring for widows and orphans and for the poor. And the final section... In this, in this portion of Galatians is verses 11 to 14, where Paul rebukes Peter. Now, again, why do, what, what is one of the reasons why Paul cites this? Now, not only is Peter, are Peter's actions inconsistent with the truth of the gospel, but one would expect if Paul had received his calling and his apostolic ministry from them, why on earth is he rebuking Peter from whom he allegedly should have received his calling and apostleship from. Okay. Doesn't make any sense if that's actually the case, what some of the Judaizers were proclaiming. But in verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, ju just to back up, we know that Peter believed, like Paul, that the dietary laws of Moses were no longer in force. We know that he believed this because we have Peter's vision in Acts 10, which Brother Gary George referenced last night, where the, the curtain comes down three times and it's filled with all manner of unclean animals and a voice, the voice of the Lord says to Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And of course, Peter refuses, never have I eaten anything unclean. And then of course, the voice says, what God has made clean, do not call uncommon. And of course, there's the teaching of Jesus, that which comes out of a man makes him unclean, but not that which goes into a man. And also verse 12, the first part states, for before certain men, and so this is the context, <clears throat> pardon me, of why Paul rebukes Peter. In Galatians 2, verse 12, the first part, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. And so Peter is actually eating unclean foods with Gentile believers. Okay. Prior to a group of believing Jews from James coming to Antioch. And so we know Peter and Paul, 
would have been agreed on the gospel and its implications with regards to this, because Peter's actually doing it. He's actually eating unclean foods with Gentile believers. And then, however, out of fear, Peter compromises the practical implications of the gospel, which he himself believes, and he compromises it out of fear, which should be, which should be a cautionary tale and a warning to us how we can do the very much the same thing. Of course, we can have some spiritual dissonance going on with what we actually believe and what we actually put into practice. And so Peter wrongly separated himself from these Gentile believers out of fear for what these Jews coming from Jerusalem, from James, were going to think. And so the second half of verse 12, but when they came, he, that is Peter, drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And then we have this word in verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Barnabas, who has been ministering with Paul, was even led astray by this, out of fear. And of course, Peter is one of the apostles, one of the inner three of the twelve who walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he sees Peter doing this, he does the same thing. And so Peter separates himself from the Gentiles out of fear of what these believing Jews are going to think who have come from James in Jerusalem. And Peter's sin is a public one by one invested with a very important office in the church, an apostle. Okay, and of course this shows that the apostles themselves are not infallible. They're not perfect. They make mistakes. And Peter's sin led others, including Barnabas, who had been ministering with Paul, to be led astray as well. Again, a cautionary tale for us with the sins that we do, whether in our families or whether... Uh, teachers in a church or in a classroom setting or wherever your workplace is, when they see believers actually doing something that is opposite or contrary to the gospel, we don't want other believers to think that that's okay. And so Paul rightly diagnoses Peter's sin as hypocrisy. So in other words, saying one thing and doing another. And we ourselves need to constantly be on guard against hypocrisy, especially when it comes to implications like this that regard the gospel. And we need to be on guard against leading others astray by our own actions as well. And so Paul, Paul, public re, wow, Paul publicly rebukes Peter for his hypocrisy. So verse 14, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, so notice, notice what Paul says there. The motivation for this rebuke is that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas before them all, so remember, this is a public sin by a very important figure in the early church, an apostle, and so Paul publicly rebukes him. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And so Paul recognize, recognizes that Peter's behavior, it's not in conformity with the gospel. It's not in conformity with the freedom that Christ has won for his people. And so he publicly rebukes Peter before them all, and he actually reveals to the entire group what Peter actually believes and how he has behaved prior to the Jews from James arriving. Because he says, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, so the cat's out of the bag. Okay? And he exposes the hypocrisy of what Peter is actually doing. And so Paul states that by his actions, Peter has identified himself, practically speaking, practically speaking, I'm not talking spiritually speaking, with those that taught that the Gentiles needed to live like Jews in order to be saved. Although, Paul, or, although Peter is actually living like a Gentile himself, and he has acted like that. And so as believers, we should be motivated by what Paul is doing here to protect the integrity of the gospel because we've been entrusted, the church has been entrusted with the gospel by God to protect it, to protect the freedom that we have in Christ and in the gospel. And of course, another practical implication out of this is especially in public sins and very grievous, important 
heinous errors, they need to be rebuked and they need to be dealt with in a spirit of love, but they need to be rebuked publicly. Now, I want to quickly kind of go through and just kind of recap. So, this, in, this entire section, so t- uh, 118 to 214, Paul is defending that his calling and his apostleship is from God. It's not from man. He didn't consult with the other apostles or with anyone. He didn't go down to Jerusalem immediately to meet with them, to confer with them. And in fact, he returns to Syria and Cilicia for about the period of three years, with a stint in Arabia, and he's preaching the gospel. And then Paul visits the apostles in Jerusalem another time. Why? The the context is that these false believers were trying to, these false brothers were trying to enslave believers. They were trying to bring them under the slavery of the Mosaic law and turn them away from the freedom that they have in Christ. And again, like I mentioned before, we need to zealously guard against any corruption or distortion of the gospel that would deprive us from the freedom that we have in Christ. Salvation is not by works, and we're not saved to do whatever we want. We're saved to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to God. And salvation is only by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and we need to zealously guard the gospel and the freedom that we have in it. And through this visit, the apostles themselves recognize that Paul's calling and apostleship is from God. Again, there's no rivalry. They recognize that the same God is at work. and They added nothing to Paul's ministry or calling. And in fact, remember in 2 Peter, what does, what does Peter say about Paul's writings? That he has written out of the wisdom that he has received from God, and he equates his writings with the other scriptures. Now, if Paul had received his calling and apostleship from men, I doubt Peter would have been saying that. But Peter and the other apostles recognized that it was from God. And this recognition, they partner with him, they fellowship with him to remember the poor. And there's no rivalry. There's no rivalry. There's no fierce opposition. There's no, oh, well, you can't do that. You can't come into the environs of Jerusalem or anything like that. There's no cutting off of fellowship. And then we have this stint where Paul rebukes Peter. And again, Peter, like Paul, believe, would have believed that the dietary laws of Moses were no longer enforced based off of Jesus' teaching, based off of the vision that he received prior to going to Cornelius. And Peter wrongly separated himself from the Gentiles out of fear. And he's led into hypocrisy by this fear. And he leads others astray. And then Paul publicly rebukes Peter. Why? Not to tear down Peter, not to destroy him, but to protect the gospel, to protect the message of the freedom in Jesus Christ. And so, believers, we must protect the integrity of the gospel. We must protect the freedom that we have in Christ and by which we have been entrusted with God, or from God. So, let us pray. Father in heaven, Father, we ask that you would speak to us, Father, that you would guide us and lead us through your Holy Spirit, Father, to treasure your gospel. Father, to guard it steadfastly. Father, to treasure your Son and what he has accomplished for us in his person and work. And Father, to joyously experience the freedom that we have in Christ, Father, the freedom to obey you. Father, the freedom to live the Spirit-filled life. Father, I pray that you would fill us with a love for others. Father, to preach this gospel to others, to share it with them, Father, that they might be broken out of the slavery to whatever they are bound to, Father, the principles of this world. Father, their old, their old man that they have in Adam, Father, I pray that you would remove it from them, Father, with the preaching of this word. Father, I pray for 
the following speakers this day. And Father, I thank you for the fellowship that we have here at this conference. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.